I'm in my room, my B&B &B in the city of Durham on one of my tour de force tours. And on this occasion, it's a two day tour, so I'm staying overnight in here. Now my principal objective for this show are three things, the cathedral of course, also the castle and Crook Hall. Now that's rather interesting because it was only taken over last year, last February in 2022 by the National Trust. I've got two cameras with me. One of course is the Olympus EM10 which I'm using as backup but the main one is the one of course that's recording this video, the EM1 Mark II with the 12 to 100 Pro lens. But perhaps most importantly, I've got the Ordnance Survey map of the area so I don't get lost. So, in my safe hands, courtesy of the Ordnance Survey, come on my tour around the city of Durham. Sir John Betjeman wanted to be station master at Durham for the view of the cathedral, regarded as one of the finest outlooks in England. Keeping faith, I arrived by train and saw the view for myself. It takes just under three hours from London. I travelled light, stayed overnight and spent two days in the cathedral city. This photo trip took three months to plan, but I had been to Durham before, so I knew what to expect. You don't have to be a student of geography or geology to appreciate the visual drama of Durham. Its cathedral and castle, both huge statements of massive Norman power, stand proud on a sandstone ridge overlooking the River Weir. The Normans valued the site's military importance. They built the castle at the northern approach to the peninsula where there is no river, followed by a cathedral in 1093, which took 40 years to complete, the old town crouching at its feet. Turner was attracted by the scene, who painted it from Framwell Gate Bridge. The area was granted World Heritage Status in 1986. Upon leaving the train, first I made for the cathedral. If it was busy that afternoon, I would return the following morning. It was cloudy, but not raining. A must-do Durham walk is to start from Turner's view and take the riverside path by the weir to Prebens Bridge, where the University Rowing Club might be in action before approaching the cathedral from South Bailey and Palace Green. The sun made a brief appearance, so I spot metered a highlight and then corrected dark areas of the image in post-production. It didn't last long, and rain was not far away. Time to head to the cathedral and for a bit of tuition on taking photographs inside. A cloudy sky can be beneficial for capturing important detail inside a church. It reduces the dynamic range and, as Norman windows are not very large, the amount of light reaching the interior can be limited. I had held, keeping the ISO at 200 with the help of image stabilizers in both camera and lens. This gave me flexibility for finding suitable viewpoints where access was restricted. Some windows in Durham Cathedral are larger, very colorful and recent. Under brighter skies they can look very dramatic, but if it is intended to record every detail, a cloudy even dull day reduces contrast. I still tend to spot me to a highlight as they can easily burn out to a pure white, removing fine detail even on the dullest of days. Furthermore, as most windows are higher than the photographer, standing further back reduces converging verticals. This makes correction in post-production 
easier, but to avoid unintentional camera shake when hand-holding, make sure that both the camera and lens image stabilizers are turned on. When including stained glass windows as part of a general theme, because of improvements in sensors and post-production software, in most cases there is no longer any excuse for having an overexposed window in a much darker church interior. It helps to underexpose the window by spot metering, and then to make corrections in post-production to both dark and light areas. I have tried HDR, but find the colours manufactured, and I don't feel that I have the same control. Unless you whack the ISO up, because of having to use a large aperture, depth of field is limited. I dislike rows of pews in shots of the nave. If you can't get rid of them, it is best to have them all sharp. However, Micro Four Thirds delivers more depth of field when required, and I decided to put it to the test with this shot, which is really pushing the technology. The 18th century rose window is above the chapel of nine altars at the east end of the cathedral, but the font is near the Galilee Chapel almost at its western end. I showed the numbers, and it is hand held but it was my fourth attempt. I will conclude this program with more shots of the cathedral, but as skies are brightening, I must hasten to Crook Hall Gardens, about half a mile away. The cathedral can be seen from the garden, and there is a medieval hall, but only a shell remains. But the old brickwork is colourful, and you might glimpse, yes, there he is, a photographer in action. Early March is not the best time to photograph gardens, but I accepted the challenge, focusing on artefacts and patterns instead of flowers. At least the lack of sun brings out detail, but don't include the dull sky. It will kill the shot completely. It clouded over again, but Durham Castle was on my hit list, so time to return to Palace Green. Even when I'm taking interiors for exteriors, I still look for a composition without a dull sky. At this point, and don't ask me why, but the battery in the EM1 was nearly depleted, so I switched over to my backup the EM10 Mark II and the 12-50 lens. I think they have done a great job. I am not religious, and although much of church architecture is created in the name of the Almighty, I view it as works of art. Nevertheless, I was invited to a service and accepted the invitation. I found it a moving experience, and whatever your faith, even if none, it makes a suitable conclusion to this program.